Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming to the Cedar Woolley City Council meeting tonight. Please rise and join me for the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And beat Army. That brings us to item C, roll call. Cheryl, please. Here. 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 Present. Chuck is ill this evening. Present. Present. Okay. Do I hear a motion to approve Council Member Owen's absence? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to Council Member Richard Owen's absence today. The motion is made by Council Member Kinzer, seconded by Council Member Lemley to excuse Council Member Owen's absence. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Next is item D, approval of tonight's agenda. Go ahead. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion. We sent the uh, consent agenda for council meeting of December 6th. Looking for a motion to approve the agenda. Oh. To approve the agenda, we're not uh, the agenda. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. So, a motion was Looking made by wrong. Council Member Lemley and seconded by Council Member Johnson to approve the agenda. All in favor? Oh, pardon aye. me. Any further discussion? My mistake. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. And the agenda is approved. Thank you. There's nothing on the consent agenda. No special guests. Staff reports. Mayor's reports. So we'll go with staff. Chief Tucker. Um, we may have had some folks uh, notice we had uh, some activity today um, right down Rita Street. Um, we had a report of a fight and uh, the fight turned into, we don't know where the other half that got beaten up went to, but the suspect hunkered down, we arrested him. Apparently he's wanted for uh, a robbery with a firearm up in Bellingham. He's wanted by Department of Corrections. And um, I believe there was another firearms related thing. So kind of an interesting afternoon. But other than that, I don't have anything else to report. Thank you, Chief. Chief Klinger. Nothing, Mayor. Aaron. Nothing. Wow. What? Tomorrow. Patsy. Nothing, Mayor. <laughs> Council member to leave. Nothing. <laughs> Jermaine? I hate to say it. Nothing. <laughs> Brenda? Well, I'm going to break the cycle here. <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> Jared, Carl, and I all went to the elected officials workshop on Saturday down in Arlington with several other city government newly elected officials, and we gained a lot of valuable information, and I feel like it was very worth our time. I'm glad that we went. Okay, thank you, Brenda. Julia? Um, I just want to say that it was an amazing Christmas parade. I want to thank Rick for that. It was a lot of fun and it was wet, but it was a lot of fun. Very nice. Rick? Uh, yeah, great parade. I was fortunate enough to be selected by the Minnows as the Grand Marshal. Had my grandson with me. He was in awe of all the lights and all the people and that. It was kind of fun. Thanks to Bob for providing a, a beautiful ride in his 64 Malibu and Nat. And great time and Nat. And uh, this coming weekend on Saturday is the home tour. Uh, be sure to put that on your calendars from 5 to 9. To nine. Uh, meet at the museum. Get maps. Things. So... Get involved with that. That's all. Thank you, Rick. Brett? I uh, just want to say that the, the parade was a blast. Ogden, my youngest boy, broke from tradition this year and uh, decided to be in the parade with the Boy Scouts instead of watching on the sidelines with us. So I got to see Rick and my <laughs> yeah. youngest Ogden in the parade. But it was, it was beautiful and always fun. So. 
Okay. So, uh, yeah, I want to echo everybody's compliments of the parade. It was wet, but it was such a good vibe. The town was beautiful, and uh, Joanne and Tom, who put up all those alders and lights, what a great job they did. It's, it's fun to have volunteers like that in town, because they don't have to do it, but it makes all the difference in the world, and uh, it was just a great time. Uh, today I went to the chamber luncheon and we heard from our new representative of the 39th, Representative uh, Carolyn Eslick. She talked to us about some of her priorities and uh, and the most important thing probably was that she said she always has an open door down there. She's got a phone number that you can call and get a hold of her. So she wants to learn about our priorities in Skagit County, which I have to say she's kind of uh, learning kind of trial by fire what Skagit's about. She would only been in for a month and we had the floods and Lyman's falling into the river and she's got a lot to learn but um, she seems up to the task and cheerful so that was a, a great time at the chamber today. I want to talk about um, the potential vacancy right here. Um, probably most of you know that I'm vying for Kirk Pearson's vacant Senate seat. Um, I don't want to count any eggs before they hatch, but I, I feel confident that I might get there. And if that happens, there's a process to fill this seat. The council will be getting um, that process from Aaron in the next council packet, so they'll know what happens. The decision will be made on January 3rd. So potentially January 3rd, somebody else goes and there's no action required on our part. But if I do go, I just want everybody to know that there's a process and uh, there's lots of talented people who can fill this position. So not to worry. We got many good people here. And that brings us down to new business. Uh, did I miss something? I hear whispering. No? Okay. Um, new business item M1, uh, which is the Joint Pre-Design Committee public, recommendation. Public, public comment, Mr. Mayor. Oh, you're right. So um, I see some faces who haven't been here for a while, and we have changed our procedures, which you probably noticed when you came in. We have two types of public comment. We have public comment uh, of the general nature, which is for anything that is not on new business and a first read or um, under old business and a second read. So now is your chance to talk about those things that aren't further in the agenda tonight. If anybody has any general public comment, the mic is open. So come on up, Ed, and uh, if, it's on the, if it's for the library, it waits till the next time. But <coughs> My name's Ed Kugel. I live at 501 Fidalgo. I'd like to talk a little bit about culture. Uh, one definition of culture would be the sum total of the ways of living built up by a group of people and transmitted from one generation to another. Now, I've heard a councilman say that the museum is our only culture, but I have to disagree. We have wood carvings, we have murals, we have Heritage Square, we have a skate park, we have the Riverfront Park, we have ball fields, we have festivals, blasts from the past, lager rodeo, the Christmas parade, and summer concerts. And we also have our library. That's 100 years of literacy, that, and it's our main indoor cultural attraction. With fine art and photography, and books of every description, and that's why many of us are so passionate about protecting our library. <laughs> um, I don't know, maybe I can't, maybe I'm not supposed to talk about this because it's about our library. But uh, I just think that uh, I'll jump ahead and try to skip the part about our library and just say uh, that I think that maybe we can keep an open mind and uh, maybe we need to think about the footage of our library and um, I just think we should keep both of our libraries basically and uh, I don't know. I guess I'll cut it short because I'm not supposed to talk about the library. Well, you'll get another chance here in just a minute, Ed, if you like. All right. Anybody else for general public comment? Yes, Paul. Uh, 
I just want to thank the city for all of its support during our events throughout the year. But this Christmas... Oh, I need you to say your name and address oh, for the record, please. Willow Kelly, Cedar Willie, 407 State Street. Um, I am also the executive director of the Chamber of Commerce, and we put on three of those events that Ed just mentioned. Um, one of the ones that was the Christmas one, and the thing that with Christmas is that everything that we do is the dollars that we raise and that we spend on it are all for the enjoyment of our entire community. And I want to thank everyone who participated and for all the sponsors that helped out. And not only did Joanne and Tom do a great job, but Hexel Corporation, that's not actually a member of our community in this town, but within our Skagit County community, came in and brought in 12 volunteers to help put up those branches. So thank them. And also to the tribe who donated the branches this year. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Paula. Anybody else for the general public comment period? I see a hand up and back. Carl. Carl Young, 1030 Warner Street. Uh, I just uh, wanted to give a compliment to the fire department for another lovely uh, decoration on the ladder truck. Uh, people come from miles around to see it. It was amazing. Um, also, uh, wanted to give a comment uh, that it looks like we need some aggregate, some pea gravel put into an alley access from Township between Jennings and Marshall on the east side of the road there. It's, it's cratered out and looks like it could uh, need some attention. Just wanted to alert you to that. Uh, also, uh, went down during the flooding uh, down there at Riverfront Park and uh, did notice the levels at the 2006 levels uh, over the home run fence of Kiwanis Fields and uh, then after the drainage seeing a lot of uh, rubbish uh, that uh, from garbage cans et cetera, that had floated and dumped and was wondering uh, when that might be cleaned up. So thank you for your time and thank you for your service. Thank you, Carl. So I took down that information for Mark on the gravel. Um, and I think you have a PUD commissioner here who uh, owns those fields, right? Because <laughs> they're not the cities. <laughs> Anybody else for the public comment period? Okay, thank you. Um, moving on now to new business, item one, jo the joint pre-design committee recommendations for the new library site and conceptual design. You see some pictures around here, and Aaron, is that yours to introduce? Yes, thank you very much. So uh, starting on page six, six of the packet is the joint memo from the pre-design committee. And just to step back in time briefly, the library partnership agreement that was executed back in July included a pre-design process. That process was for the city and the district to each appoint three members to a committee. That committee would work with SHKS, the architecture firm, to develop a public process. The architects would run the public process, take input from the community, and ultimately uh, deliver a plan. The committee, in addition to the architect's plan, would make recommendations regarding location, concept design, that's the architect's plan, and budget. And with those three decisions, uh, the agreements that the City Council adopted back in July would become firm agreements and uh, we would move forward to acquire land, jointly operate a library, uh, design a library, and ultimately construct a library. So the committee members for the district included Mary Alice Grobens, Chris Silvis, and Jean Johnson. For the city, it was uh, Julia Johnson, Dr. Howland, the chair of the City Library Board, and me. So we met on a number of occasions, went through this process. The architects, of course, met with the community in a large public workshop, uh, put out a survey, met with a, a, a sort of a strategic group of invited guests, also met with library staff, uh, did those meetings twice. That all culminated in an open house last Wednesday right here in these chambers. Uh, some of the boards you see in the back of the room were from that open house. 
They took some additional comments and feedback at that meeting, uh, finalized their report, and issued it uh, late last week. That's what's in your packet for consideration tonight. The Joint Pre-Design Committee is recommending the site located at 100 West State Street. That's the old feed store across from e, &E Lumber or Kitty Corner from e, &E Lumber and next to the Iron Skillet. Uh, you can see that graphically represented on the first board here up against the wall. The conceptual design is uh, really what's in the SHKS report and it's, it's fairly early. Uh, I would say when we created these agreements back in July, in my mind, there would have been a really beautiful architectural rendering of the building yet to come. That was naive. There's uh, so much design work uh, to be undertaken. That's not going to happen until we get into full design that uh, you know, we don't have the pretty picture that I know a lot of people have been wanting for a long, long time now. Uh, you can see if you look at, I think, the second panel on this side, just some basic massing concepts of how a building could fit on the site, how it would be oriented to the streetscape and to the sun, um, as well as how the various uses within the library could fit in that space. So you'll see that in the report. Uh, finally, the budget uh, proposed here, the recommended budget, is consistent with the original agreements. Uh, those agreements called for $5 million in debt. Uh, they also call for contributions of $30,000 a month once, once we moved into joint operations. Uh, that would begin uh, depending on our time frame. If the City Council acts next week and the District acts the following week, those contributions would begin to go into the Library Construction Fund in March of 2018, and they would go into that fund until the December prior to the year where our first bond payment is due. So I think we can safely uh, and comfortably believe that we would have at least uh, $300,000 collected in that fund that could go into the project. That's where the $5.3 million comes from. That 5.3 does not include the uh, $1.525 million that was in the agreements for opening day collection, furniture, fixtures, and equipment. Uh, additionally, the city has requested $2 million in capital funding from the Washington State Legislature. Uh, we will continue to pursue that in 2018. And uh, if those dollars are granted by the legislature, let me see if I can pull up the correct page to show you that. Uh, it's the I think it's the third board on this wall that we can't see, and it would be page in the packet, page, yeah, page 20, um, 25 or 35. I can't quite read that. I'm sorry. It's page 26. 26 of the packet is the large format page. You have to kind of scrunch it to fit your screen. The, oh, there we go. Now, it's, it just took a long time to come into focus because of the size of the file. <coughs> so page 26 of the packet, the $5.3 million budget is adequate to build a 10,000 square foot library. Uh, that size is smaller than I think many of us had hoped for and imagined we would be building. Uh, however, it is a realistic uh, size for our budget. With the addition of $2 million in capital funding or other funding, fundraising, however it may be, uh, architects believe they can build at least an additional 3,000, possibly 4,000 square feet. And so what you see on the right-hand side of that screen are three categories, the early learning through play, the STEAM center, and lifelong learning senior space. Those types of activities will exist in whatever library gets built, but those additional dollars would provide dedicated space for those activities that would be very significant. Yeah, uh, for citizens, I'm looking at page 19 of the library report. Flip over to page 19. Yeah, so it's page 26 of the council packet, page 19 of the architect's report. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of outline that as, uh, as you look at the budget conversation so you understand where we're at with that. Um, the reality is this project's taken uh, longer to get from beginning to now. Uh, we're escalating cost estimates now all the way to 2019, so 
Um, the market also hasn't been particularly friendly to us in this intervening time period. So we, we believe construction costs will be higher than they were when we first started discussing this concept. And for that reason, our dollars just aren't going to go as far as we might hope. If you look at page um, 22 of the packet, page 15 of the report, and page 14 of the report, page 21, you can see the existing square footages of the city library on page 22 or 15, depending on which version you're looking at, and the district on page 21 of the report, page four, 21 of the packet, and page 14 of the report. Uh, the, the combined total of the two is about 8,310 feet. City library is about 6,070 square feet. So a 10,000 square foot li library, well, smaller than the library that we may have imagined is larger than what the city currently has and uh, larger than what the city and the district currently have together. And of course, our, our hope is that between the time when this gets approved and the time when we move into the full schematic design, we would have a funding decision from the legislature that would allow us to really plan for those additional square feet. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. I know there are a number of committee members here tonight, too, who could answer any questions. I was wondering, when when abouts would you expect to know about that, uh, the capital budget um, request? Well, so the 2018 session is a 60-day session, and the track record on those short sessions has been pretty good. So I, I think the conventional wisdom and what we're hearing from uh, the person that the city's hired to help us with this effort is, is to think that it's likely that they will wrap up in mid-March as scheduled yeah. because of the, just the pragmatic reality that sitting members of the state legislature can't fundraise until they leave Olympia and it's an election year for uh, half the Senate and all of the House. So um, there, there's some thinking that they're going to get that job done. I also heard today at the chamber lunch uh, something that I thought was very interesting, which was our new state representative, a Republican, uh, very clearly articulating her belief that the Hearst decision and the capital budget solutions needed to be separated. Um, so if, if she's at all... Um, expressing the views of uh, the Republican Party in Olympia, then that would, that would certainly be an indication that the capital budget may get moving again. And there's two issues there. We've got the 2017 capital budget that really does need to get cleared out. So the 2018 supplemental capital budget, where our request would be potentially funded, can also get moved through the process. And that that can't happen without bipartisan work in Olympia. They don't have, neither party would have the votes to run the capital budget with the associated bonding capacity without uh, a bipartisanship. So that's a, it's really an answer, I guess, is who knows, but that's what we're hearing. So how did, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, how do you, um, for the design, how do you get started and, and know, like, do you just have like a, I don't know how you, how you do that, not knowing if you're going to get that other funding. Yeah, you know? so uh, I think we probably will uh, do preliminary design work that doesn't get the architects into the space, uh, you know, their, their phase of work where that square footage question is critical. So we won't spend their time and our project's money on something that would have to be redesigned. Uh, but that time period is pretty short. You know, if, if we're to kick the architects off, let's say sometime in January, middle, late January, with an actual uh, contract to do full full design work on this project, and you know, we've got a process to go through. That's already a couple weeks into the session before they're starting, and there's definitely work that they can be doing that's not dependent on that factor. Well, we kind of wait for that decision to get made. So I, I think that will be all right. You do bring up the issue of the timeline, which I just mentioned. Uh, architects, I think, are estimating that they'd like to have 2018 to do that design work, put together the construction specs, the bid package. And our goal would be to really come out early 2019, be the first project bid of the year to take advantage of a, what we hope to be a slightly hungrier construction bidding climate. And then it would be uh, probably a nine to 12 month construction project. 
move in, uh, you know, commission the building, move into the building, really looking for occupancy. And I would say early 2020, Kevin Kane says late 2019, so mm -hmm. about two years from now. So if I could just add a little self-promotion to that, it wouldn't hurt to have a senator down there on the Ways and Means Committee who is from Cedro Woolley. So, so talk to your uh, county commissioners. I, I just want to add uh, to that location, which we, we all know was not my first choice, but there's a couple of good things that happen to have happened um, and will be happening at the same time. We uh, got our transportation improvement money to repave the street, so that means new street, new sidewalks at that location, and we've also recently had some success with the railroad in maybe removing some tracks there and lowering the grade. So there's a potential for this all to come together and uh, have a lot of positives along with the construction. Are there any other questions from, or comments from council before we open it to public comment? Okay, at this time on the topic of uh, item one, the joint pre-design committee recommendations for a new library site and conceptual design. I'll open it to the public, uh, same rules, three minutes each, and uh, Ed, you are in a hurry, so I'll let you come on up. <coughs> well, Ed Kugel, 501 Fidalgo. Um, Initially, I was just talking about the culture, and uh, my main point was I think our library is really a very valuable cultural asset to our community. To me, it's our main cultural asset. <laughs> and uh, I still don't, uh, as you probably already know, I didn't really think this was a good idea, but if you're still committed to this merger, I hope you'll at least keep an open mind and consider a few modifications. Um, if two STEM programs are good for our city, then why wouldn't two libraries be good? We've already spent all the money for our current library. All it's going to take is <clears throat> for you to pay for the <clears throat> personnel to take care of it. Um, mm -hmm. As soon as you merge our libraries, you're going to have to start throwing away books. And I think that's a waste of resources. Um, the Central Library has uh, three, 2,000 square feet, you say, and uh, if you merge our libraries, we're going to have to start getting rid of books to make room for their books in our library. Um, if you wait until we have a new library, then we won't have to do that. And uh, like I said, I think we've already made the investment in our, in our old library. There's nothing really wrong with it. It's just it's not big enough. And it seems like the main problem with this new library is it's not big enough. So why don't we have two libraries, and then we'll have another 6,000 square feet of space. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Anybody else for public comment? Dr. Howland. Tim Howland, 26203 Minkler Road, and then I also own property at 200 Murdoch Street. Uh, yeah, as a part of a lot of what's been going on with this, I want to really support the, the idea of voting for this. I think the new library will give us an opportunity to provide some new library services for the future, and that's really what I'm thinking about here. And I'll put in a plug for the school district bond and levy right now, but anyway, <laughs> that's a lot of what we're after on all of this, is trying to get our buildings upgraded so that in the future we have the buildings that we need to help educate kids, which is the future of Cedar Woolley. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't emphasize that enough, how important the library and the school buildings and such are to this city. So um, I, I like the plan. It's not as big as we hoped. We don't have as much money as we'd like to have, and there are going to have to be trade-offs. So anyway, we do what we can, and to a large extent, when we're talking about library services, I don't think a huge space is necessary if you have a staff dedicated to, and a community dedicated to making these various uh, services available to us all. So anyway, 
I support the library decision, and I'd like to see you guys pass it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holland. Anybody else from the public on this topic? Paula. Paula Kelly, 407 State Street, Cedar Willie. Um, I have been for this project since it began, and I've also enjoyed the support of the Cedar Willie Chamber of Commerce Board on that decision. And I think it's important to note that what we see this as being is a great asset for the community. When I, um, when we discuss whether or not there should be one library or two, in my mind, it does not make sense to duplicate things that can be done in one building as opposed to two. You have then two sets of overhead, you have two sets of staff. Um, I would rather see that money being spent on the resources than on additional staffing and overhead. It makes better sense to me. I do hope that as we move forward on this, that you keep the public involved. I think it has been a great way to make sure that we're going to get the library that we want within the budget that we have. And so if you um, keep doing what you've been doing, which is letting people come up and discuss with you what's going on, I think we'll get the best library we can. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Paula. Anybody else? John. Uh, John Janicki, 13563 Teak Lane, um, Clear Lake. Um, I read the report. It's very well done. It, uh, I believe that they actually listened to all of the people that had input, and I think they balanced it very well. If you look at the percentage of what the collection is of uh, areas for books relative to all the other spaces, it seems appropriate. Um, it seems plenty big. If you look at the priorities, the priorities were the books and collections and hours. They want more hours and they want a traditional library. So maker spaces and all these other things and daycare, all that stuff is all kind of cool and be nice, but people want a traditional library with more hours. And that and 10,000 square feet is plenty to do that. So I think they did a really good job, the whole team, listening to everybody, balancing what they have. Um, if you, you needed one location with one set of staff, as soon as you double, uh, I happen to know when you start adding lo multiple locations, it becomes very inefficient. And so um, I think, uh, uh, um, think 10,000 square feet is actually a big building. Uh, if you get some more money from the state, fine, always take it. Um, but, um, you know, um, I, I think the report was really well done. And um, I think you should go full speed ahead. I don't think there's anything to stop. It's a great location. Um, it's going to be good for everything that everybody wants. And you're going to have a place. Uh, there's plenty of room to check out a book and to read a book or read an e-book or whatever in this new library. So I say go full speed ahead. Thanks. Thank you, John. Anybody else for the public comment period? Sylvia. Hi, I'm Sylvia Matterin from Clear Lake. So I'm in the Central Skagit Library District. And I've been interested in the- But I do need an address. Oh, you do? OK. Mm -hmm. 13294 State Route 9. And um, anyway. I've been interested in combining the two libraries for a couple of years now, and I think it's going to be wonderful as far as being more efficient and taking care of the needs of those of us outside of the city as well as the needs of the people in the city. Um, just in the last couple of days is the first that I've heard of this location, and I'm pretty excited about that too. Um, initially, the Central Library was located in a portion of that building, 
and it was actually super convenient for my mom and I to be able to stop in and use that library. And re referring to culture, um, to me a library, I mean it's, it's wonderful to think of it for the children and we definitely want it for the children but it's great for old folks like me and even older folks like my mother as well and I think adds to the culture of all ages. So um, looking at the proposal, looking at the ideas, um, I think it's a wonderful thing and encourage you to vote yes for it. Thank you, Sylvia. Anybody else? Hand up, Adrian. Hi, I'm uh, Adrian Santangelo, 612 Cedar Tree Drive here in Cedar Woolley. And um, I also wanted to say that I am in full support of this library. Uh, we have been talking back and forth quite a bit about it, both as a community and as a, a business owner and as actually as a father with two young children. Um, looking at the way the schools are going lately and what the needs are, uh, one of the things that I am seeing that is lacking in the current one is you know, the, the technical side of stuff. And I'm a tech guy, it's not a big secret. And uh, I'm looking forward to actually having that be available because both of my children are now being expected to do these things in school the way they are right now. And I know lots of other kids that are the exact same way but don't have the same resources that our family does. And I see this library being a huge benefit in that case, not just for the, the tech side as well, but even for the art side too. You know, STEAM, not STEM. I like that very much. And I would encourage you guys to all to vote for that and to keep that moving along. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Adrian. Anybody else? Phil. My name's Philip Murray. I live at 223 State Street. I also have property on 101 Woodworth Street, which is 100 feet away from where you're deciding to build this. And I'm still waiting to hear a notice of what you are doing there because it might affect my plans or my property. And uh, because the zoning and stuff um, is business, and this is not a business that you're putting in there. Um, it, you're also taken away from the tax structure from town from the town, which Three Rivers was um, p part of the reason why they couldn't put the library there was because of that. Um, the other thing is down the street there's a pot store. How far away is it? Is it within legal limits of a school or a park or anything? Um, across the street, you, um, you're you're going to be having. Place where people can go outside and read books. Well, across the street, you're going to be hearing chainsaws, and I don't want to see them getting in trouble because of their business. Um, I think the new, the uh, old library is a perfect spot for the new library. Just add on to it. You're saving a lot of money. Um, to impact to neighbors, yeah, that's covered. Decided to put in. Yeah, and I'm, I'm wondering who decided to put it in the downtown district because you wouldn't put a school down there. So why would you put a library in the downtown business district? It doesn't make sense to me. It should be stay out where it's at because it's uh, already paid for. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Anybody else? Is that Jared getting up to come up here? Okay, Jared. Jared Couch, A24 Earthway. I just want to say hats off to the council for everything you've been through with this project. Um, I think our town greatly needs the library. I think you've picked an outstanding potential location. Um, I don't think it's a booming metropolis and we're not pulling a, a big business out of the tax base. So I think you've picked a, a kind of an eyesore in the town to turn it into something beautiful, something that the, the community needs and that uh, the children will use. Um, growing up on the outskirts of, of Cedar Woolley, it's uh, pretty normal to travel into town as a kid and you know it's nice to be able to, to know that we'll have a state-of-the-art library. Um, I just hope that uh, you continue forward on the track that you've been on and um, 
get this finished up because I think it's a great plan. I've read through packet after packet, um, looked at the pictures, um, and I think it's I think it's outstanding, and it'll be a it'll be a great service to our community. So, great job to the council and the mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Anybody else? Going once, going twice, so we'll close the public comment period for uh, item one under paragraph M. Any comments from the council? It's first read, no action tonight, but we'll be coming back for action next round. Just Rick? curious, uh, looking at a graph here and it shows uh, parking in the back of 18 parking spaces and such, and with staff employees at any given time, there'll be what, three or four? staff on hand, possibly more, which will take some. So to, with that and maybe closing that right-hand lane on State Street to make parallel parking that might add five or six more, is that going to be adequate parking during a busy time of the library used to accommodate the right -hand all of the cars, the short of people going across the street into the old marketplace parking lot? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's not really intended to be a final site plan or anything of that nature. I don't think anybody on the committee believes that 18 spaces is, is the right number. Um, there's still a number of questions to be resolved, including the one-story, two-story question. Two-story obviously would put more parking in the lot. Uh, I do believe we could get uh, six or eight more parking places right on State Street by deleting that right-hand turn lane that you mentioned. <laughs> That project, uh, uh, that, that section of the street will be resurfaced next year, so there's a great opportunity to make that change. Similar change was made on the south side this year as part of the construction project of that new commercial property. Um, I think there's also probably uh, six or eight more spaces that could be shown on the map as it's currently drawn that aren't there. But that really wasn't the, the point of that slide, was, was just to kind of show if you had a 13,000 square foot single story structure, how would that fit on the lot and what's left? Uh, the conversation about how, uh, how to fit the adequate parking and where that will go is yet to come. Um, but my sense is more on site, some on State Street, and possibly some on the railroad, or not on the railroad, but next to the railroad, uh, you know, west of the marketplace there. Oh, I, uh, there's one other item I, I neglected to mention that question. came up a couple times in comments tonight, which is uh, we'll just let the district go build a 10,000 square foot library and then we'll all have more. I, I think that may be based upon one of the questions and answers, the FAQs on our website. That's a really old FAQ and it was, it was uh, generated. The question essentially is, hey, I've been hearing the 10,000 square foot library would get built. You know, what's up with that? The answer is, well, that's what the district would do if they go it alone. Well, that, that information uh, was before the district contracted with uh, an architect out of Mount Vernon to do a district-specific cost study. And the result of their cost study was that there's no scenario where they could afford to build a 10,000-square-foot library on a go-it-alone path. Uh, so that's, that's not a scenario that's at all um, even remotely feasible. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Anything else from council before we? Well, yeah, on? I guess um, with the new commercial, the residents that are being built in the library in that little corridor there, it makes sense to include transit in the streetscape. I don't know. We've heard from, I guess, a couple of people about transit. Um, and I don't, is this maybe probably directed at Mark? But uh, in the design for the street repaving, is there a way to include? a shelter or some sort of stop because you have residents across the street, you're going to have people coming and going mm -hmm. to the library. Should we include SCAT? Yeah, I, I got similar inquiries about would there be a bus stop there. Um, that would probably be up to Skagit Transit. You know, we already have the big kind of central station uh, over by the drugstore, so it's a short walk, but Maybe there's something that could be done to make a stop closer so people could use it. Well, they, I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, they drive through town. Just make it, you know, list a little, what do you, you see them all over this kind of a little lean to with a, a roof where people could sit out of the rain while they're waiting for their bus. Well, I think we, we can have that conversation with SCAT. The, the road project itself is, is only within the existing kind of curb to curb section. Uh, the library project, however, may potentially have the ability to include 
in that area that's between the library, the future library property and the current road is all right of way. It's a fairly large section. So whether that's entirely uh, pedestrian oriented or it could include transit, we'll have to coordinate with SCAT. You know, their route currently uses ferry for that main flow. Yeah. The question would be from SCAT and really from the community is would they prefer to shift to state? Uh, or are mm -hmm. they hoping, you know, w would, would there be enough demand to have some sort of loop in that area? Definitely, as the mayor says, a SCAT question, but one that we're happy to coordinate with them on. Thanks. And, and just to clarify, the things that are being brought up, they're all great um, questions and concerns. And, and as a committee, we have already started to look at some of that and talk about it. So it's, mm -hmm. it, it is being um, not necessarily addressed, but actually factored in. So. Yeah, and I guess I didn't talk about that. Uh, the process going forward, if, if the city council uh, uh, approves this, th these three questions are really what's left in the city council's action to complete the agreement, complete the partnership. That action, uh, whichever body acts last, is the, effect, uh, is the effective date to begin a 60-day clock, uh, 60 days after, let me say that differently, 60 days after the last of the two bodies approves the location concept design and budget is the effective date under the agreements that triggers the joint operation. So on that point, the district would uh, physically move into the Cedarly Public Library and operate it uh, with our, our employees becoming district employees uh, from that point all the way until we move into the new library. That's also what would then trigger the full design process and ultimately construction. Under the agreements, the uh, the joint owner representatives are designated as the district's uh, library director and the city supervisor. So currently that would be Gene Williams and me. And we're charged with developing a public process to continue to engage the community in the design phase. Uh, we've discussed that and uh, uh, our preliminary thought would be to have at least two, possibly three joint workshops between the city council and the district board open to the public where public input would be taken, the first of which at the 30% design phase. So architects would come in, kind of share their 30% plans and ideas, plenty of time to incorporate suggestions, take that information in, uh, make whatever modifications get made, do that again, maybe in the, the 50 to 60% range, and then have a third meeting, which is really the 100% pre-bid conversation Here's what we've got. We're ready to go build it. Make sure we didn't miss anything. So uh, definitely future opportunities for continued public engagement on the design itself. Uh, but this building will not be designed by committee or by uh, you know the public coming in with sticky dots to say what they like the best. It's it's going to have to be designed just you know more typically for a project uh, if we're hoping to get from the beginning to the end in any reasonable fashion. Thank you, Aaron. Anything else? Okay, moving on to uh, item two, uh, resolution authorizing the mayor to execute the necessary documents to complete the purchase. Um, and that is page 56 through 59 of your packet, Aaron. Sure. Uh, so two items on this uh, recommendation. One, one's the uh, resolution authorizing the closing of the uh, deal so the city's already a party to a real estate purchase and sale agreement with the property owner. Uh, this resolution is something that our friends in the escrow companies have started to like, more than me just telling them that the council said we could, although I do believe that should be legally sufficient if the mayor signs, different issue. So resolution gives our escrow folks comfort, and it also clearly delegates the authority to the mayor to sign documents that are necessary as part of real estate transactions without each of those documents coming back to you. Uh, examples would be the real estate excise tax affidavit, the escrow closing instructions, those sorts of things that are uh, you know, fairly standard and are also required. The current purchase and sale agreement in effect has a negotiated purchase price of 281000 We have a feasibility phase that's currently set to expire on December 22nd. Uh, that would be the day after the library district's meeting in December, at which time they could take action. 
And uh, assuming we work past that December 22nd feasibility period and don't um, cancel the agreement at that point, the closing would occur uh, December 27th, no later than December 27th. Which brings us to the second resolution, which is how do we pay for it? Ultimately, the proceeds necessary for this real estate transaction will come from the $5.3 million budget. But in the interim period between now and when we actually start depositing those dollars into the library construction fund and issue debt, uh, the proposal is to borrow money uh, from the city's uh, fund 302, which is our capital projects reserve fund. That's where the real estate excise tax dollars go to be spent from Fund 302 to Fund 305, which is the library construction fund. So the second resolution allows those dollars to be borrowed from 302 uh, by 305. That it carries interest at the rate of the local government investment pool for the time period that the loan's outstanding and establishes a repayment uh, process and time frame based upon what I just discussed for the library project funding. Uh, both those are necessary for us to get this job done. And do we have, oh, and then the last thing in the first resolution that I didn't mention but is clearly in the title of it is the authorization to issue a manual payment. So kind of the, maybe the most important part of that is it gives uh, the mayor and Patsy the ability to actually sign a check uh, and take <laughs> that over and hand it to the escrow company. So any questions on that? Nope. Except what number are we working on? Okay. Um, since since items two and three are so closely related, um, I think we should consider those together. They're both a first read. Um, any comments or questions before we open it to public comment period? Because we're purchasing it, does it? I mean, is there a need to elongate the process? I mean. It should we get the purchase underway, or do we need the time to wait? I don't think there's anything there's technically no. pressing, and, and since there isn't, I would prefer to, you know, it's always up to the council, but I like to stick to our second reading convention, unless there's some dire reason. Otherwise, uh, we end up doing that all the time, and then we, we void ourselves. My thoughts. Any other comments? So at this time, um, I will open items two or three for public comment. Please come to the podium, state your name and address for the record. I mean, it's really just an extension of uh, item one, but it's there if you want it. So I might just mention on item three, there are some components of that that are unrelated to the library. Uh, that's the 2017 budget amendment which oh, yeah. includes the library funding, but it also includes a number of other mm -hmm. smaller budget adjustments that are made in what I would consider the normal course of business. But Patsy could address any specific issues on there if there are questions. Any questions? Okay, I'll keep the podium open for that purpose. Ed, same rules. Ed Kugel, 501 Fidalgo. <clears throat> i just like to say I'm for a new library. Um, I just think that when you consider the amount of people we're adding to our library system, more than doubling the population, and when you consider the growth that the city will have in the next 20 years, um, I think the library is a little undersized, and I, I'm just a little disappointed that the council won't consider any more funding for the library. The mayor himself admitted at one of our meetings that we have underfunded our library in the past. And it's a little disappointing to all of you who are so for our library, think we should continue to underfund it for the next 20 years. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Anyone else? Phil. Philip Murray, 223 State Street, Cedar Valley. Um, I'm wondering what's going to happen with the old library. What are you going to do with that? And if 
if you place this library where you're thinking about putting it on uh, State Street, you're going to run out of room real quick. And there is no room to expand. And I keep telling you, you already own the land, you have the room, you could expand again, you could tear down one building or whatever over there and be able to, in the park, which doesn't get used except by people from, kids from the school, uh, to smoke cigarettes or whatever, and uh, <laughs> you'd, you'd, you could expand and have plenty of parking. And uh, that's about it. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. Anybody else? Okay, at this time I'll close the public comment period for items two and three, and we are down to good of the order. Council? In that case, thank you all for coming. Without objection, we stand adjourned.